Um, so welcome everyone uh, for today's talk uh, on environment and humanity series. Uh, I'm Rahul Ranjan uh, and I'm co-organizing this series with um, Shalini uh, Ayangar. Um, Shalini is not able to attend today because she's traveling, um, but she'll be joining in and out um, as she get to the network area. Uh, this is a larger series uh, which has been drawn from and built over from other two series which were held um, last year and a year before that. So this is a this is a series that draws specifically on uh, role of environmental humanities in India, but also reconfigure some of the concerns uh, that were part of the uh, series I've held last year where we've had uh, over 12 people, speakers who've in, spoken on different dimension of um, political ecology, climate change, um, and humanities in India. This is a series uh, that draws out um, a number of scholars who would speak and have been speaking on uh, several issues, including uh, land subsidence, uh, role of indigenous people in climate change, uh, role of literature in the era of climate change, non-human fascism, um, and amongst other. Um, so there are a couple of uh, housekeeping rules that I lay out before we move on to the introduction of our speaker. So there are two ways to ask questions. One way is to formulate your question and write it into the chat box. And I'll have the question read at the end of the talk. The second way to ask the question is to raise your hand using emojis. Uh, I will unmute you and you can ask your question yourself. In either way, uh, you can write to me on chat, chat box at any point. Um, the session, uh, the presentation would last for about 45 to 50 minutes, uh, and then we will have about 20 minutes for question and answer. Um, so um, welcome, Sumona. Um, for a brief introduction, uh, Dr. Sumona Ray is a professor of, associate professor of English and creative writing at uh, Ashoka University where she runs the Indian Plant Humanities Project with Center for Climate Change and Sustainability. She's the author of How I Became Tree, a work of nonfiction, Missing a Novel, My Mother's Lover and Other Story, and two poetry collection, Out of Syllabus and VIP, Very Important Plant. I've been drawn to, as do Shalini, we've both been drawn to Sumana's work, especially by reading closely How I Became Tree, which we both now teach uh, in respective courses uh, that uh, that we run here um, at Oslo Met uh, and and at Yale where she's uh, Shalini is based. Uh, so um, um, welcome, Sumana, and you have about 40, 45 minutes to speak. I will turn off my video, but I'm going to be sitting here. So at any point, do you need me? You can just ask me and I'll come back. Thank you. Uh, when Rahul first asked me uh, to speak, I think the title I had given him was Climate Change and the Loss of Ananda. As I was preparing for my talk uh, with your permission and Shalini's Rahul, I've just changed it briefly, um, not sorry, briefly, but slightly to Climate Grief and the Loss of Ananda, which of course seems like tautology and I want to trace this trajectory. Uh, thank you to all of you for taking the time to join us and to Rahul and Shalini in particular for asking me to speak at the symposium. I say this not from any sense of formality, but from the gratitude of being noticed and welcomed into a space that I know from always feeling illegitimate everywhere that I would have otherwise hesitated to enter. I am no scholar. I'm also not a real academic. Rahul and Shalini know that I will not have all the data and numbers to back up anything I say today. That much of what I say will come from the very limited archive of my life and literary cultures that I've been allowed to be a part of. And yet their open-hearted belief, not just in me, but in this space, in something valuable that is still not unfortunately a part of academic discourse, 
is both encouragement and gift to someone like me, who's coming to the subject of climate change from an emotional and experiential perspective. Over the course of the next half an hour or so, I'll try to share with you and then of course hear from you, as Rahul said, thoughts on, thoughts on how Anundo or Ananda, whichever way you choose to pronounce it, a way of feeling that we once took for granted, not realizing that it was a philosophy of life that was really an achievement of the Indic imagination, how Ananda has come to be replaced by climate grief or climate fatigue. My thoughts, as always, are fragmentary, and I share them in the hope that they will make us think about our relationship with the elements in a slightly more intimate way. That is all I hope to do in my talk today. I also have something else to say. I'm speaking to you from a place called Sonipat, where there are frequent power cuts. It is possible that I will lose connectivity from the Wi-Fi for a minute or more. I also hope you will bear with me knowing that in these fluctuations and striations of the unexpected, was once a way of life that gave us joy and humor. As a way of shorthand, because the title of my talk has Ananda in it, as a way of shorthand, Ananda in Sanskrit, and consequently in many Indian languages, is delight, joy, pleasure, all of these, but also more. Buddhist, Jain, and Hindu traditions often think of Ananda as bliss, <clears throat> it's the highest state of being. The word Ananda derives from Nandati, meaning he or she or they rejoice. Even though the word Ananda and the category of Ananda has passed through various, sometimes seemingly even antagonistic traditions of thinking, the full-throated and open-mouthed belief in Ananda, which we've always had as a culture, I think is, as I said, one of the greatest achievements of the Indic imagination and how it has remained unchanged even as it has gone through a process of seeming secularization. Not until now, when we feel its presence only through its absence, but I'll come to that later, first at the beginning. I want to take you on a trip with me, at least at the very beginning. Please try to imagine this with me. I imagine the first sentence spoken on earth as I try to speak the first sentence here. What could it have been about? Somehow, I have always imagined it, imagined it to have been about the earth. It is possible that this comes from the same fold in my mind that wants to believe that all conversations between lovers are about love. All conversations on earth are Think about it, about the earth itself. Among all the discoveries that have come my way, it was this, when I first discovered that the Sanskrit word for the earth and emotions come from the same root, bhu. I think I breathed the same breath twice. Bhu, becoming bhumi, the earth, and bhavna, feelings and thoughts. And then it struck me, how could it have been otherwise? It has been years since that epiphany, and I have, given my propensity to nag and stalk words, labored on this thought in other languages as well. Earth, emotions, elements. Surely it's, it's not a coincidence that these words began from the same letter, the same sound. Earth, emotions, elements. There is a side note that is inevitably a shadow to these thoughts. How the ancients knew that the earth moved for bhava, feelings, move and change position like the earth and that both are not fixed. That our emotions are alike with elements is both suspicion and belief, belief that drives human life. It has decided where we love, live, where we let go of the dead, where we read and sing and cry and wait. The architecture of our lives is decided in the conversation between the elements and emotions. It begins, as I said, from the earth. And as if to emphasize this intuitive awareness, the Hindu prayers begin and often end with Om, understood as the sound of the universe, a word substitutable with Bhumi, the earth. 
I too must begin with the earth. And so this, the call of places, of landscapes, of its highest and lowest points, of sharp peaks, which seem to have place only for our toes, and giant paunchy valleys and water bodies, which seem capable of accommodating an infinite number of the living and the dead. This urge, the English language began calling tourism. The word tourist, believe me, is young, younger than Shakespeare, and only a couple of decades older than the permanently young poet Keats. It means, of course, making a journey, stopping here and there. What is the here and there that one stops at? These are quite obviously the tourist spots, those that have, since their first moment of discovery by a lonely traveler, gathered fur and bone, to become a living being whose door one must knock at before one leaves the place. Visiting these tourist sites is therefore like a bit of a courtesy call now, a commemoration of that first moment of enchantment, a bit like visiting a memorial. One is never alone in these places. It is not only the crowds I mean, but the impress of hundreds of thousands before us, all strangers, now related to each other by this view in front of them. It is like the words in a wedding, uttered by priest, parent, partner, or marriage registrar, polished by time, like the steps to a site of pilgrimage are polished by human feet, uniting us to strangers as it is to the person beside us or behind us. We look at these mountains and the sunsets they hide and reveal, oceans that do not know rest or stillness, and we experience something similar to the love we feel for people. What we call wanderlust and cabin fever are only a manifestation of viraha, the urge to be with the lover after the torture of separation, a longing to be with that which constitutes us. In this, the earth and the lover are alike for love and the force of gravity are alike. They prevent us from falling. The phrase falling in love recognizes this anal analogous relationship between the lover and the earth, this moment of separation. Tan, it's a word in Bangla, used to speak about a person's attraction to another. This is not necessarily romantic. It is affection of all genres. One complains about how the tan, attraction that ties or binds like a string, the pull of a string, tan is verb, that pull, for another person does not allow them freedom, the freedom to move on or move away. Phrases we use a lot in our relationships. This invisible force is analogical to the force of the earth that doesn't let us fall away. Shringar, the rasa or art emotion of love, beauty, and affection exists in two modes. Vipralamba shringar or an aestheticized love in separation and a sambhoga shringar, aestheticized love in union. The Natya Shastra, because Bharat Muni, means this to be a text, manual if you may, about theater, about performance and acting, means the show of Shringar to be between actors, between people. I understand the concept of Shringar and indeed all the other rasas and their ultimate telos of finding Ananda as the relationship, however fleeting or fluid, between the human and the natural world. I think you've guessed this already from the slant of what I have said so far. Separation or viraha is what we feel when we experience separation not only from a human beloved, but from the earth itself. Sambhoga or union is what we experience when we return to earth. Think of the astronauts return to earth, for instance. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> that is why the Kama Sutra, which is meant to a manual, which is meant to be a manual about love, about erotic love, is full of earth and water references of plant and roots and growing. Think also from the languages you live in, of the many songs of Viraha, where the lover longs for the missing one, through metaphors of the chan, <clears throat> the moon, 
Think of the Earth's relationship with the moon, the water, the tides. All of these, not just metaphorical, but as we know from our, from our own experience, literally produce Tringar and Ananda, great joy, great delight in us. Almost as an aside, let me explain why I'm making this equivalence between the human and the elements. Uh, let me take the case of touch, for instance. I cannot exactly say why I feel the sadness here when I'm in Sonipat, where I live, teach and live during the teaching semesters. I'm not even sure whether I can really call it sadness. It's unease, the kind of unease that one feels from hunger or lack of sleep from missing something necessary. Let me share an old memory with you, if you allow me. This is from some time ago. It's been 12 days since I touched someone, a human being. I live my, by myself in this place, a few kilometers away from the university campus where I teach. Temperamentally reclusive, I teach, meet my students and colleagues, do my work and return to my flat. This one from where I'm speaking to you. It is only at night, the 12th day after I have seen my family, that I begin to realize that something is wrong with me. Without any cooperation from myself, tears begin to flow. They dry on my cheeks after some time. Remember lying to my left, the white wall of my bedroom in front of me. <clears throat> Suddenly, again without my active intervention, my right hand begins patting my right cheek, then running fingers through my own hair. I realize that it is this that I have been missing without being aware of it. Touch, the touch of another human. It is perhaps the same uneasiness one feels when away from land for some time, or which by another name we call homesickness. We are all like iron. We to rust if left untouched for too long. Notice how this behavior of seeking touch, of desiring union, which as we know is actually reunion with, and the ananda of finding it manifests itself in our art forms. To begin with, let's take music. The beginning of a song deriving from the behavior of the raga is called the sama. My music teacher, a Bengali, used to call it shom. I would inevitably mishear it as home. That mishearing would annotate my understanding of the musical composition so that it would seem to me that after the journeys in the Antara and the Shanchari, the second and third stanzas, the song must return to the summer, the home from where it had begun its journey. Do we start from sleep to a state of wakefulness and return to sleep or is it the opposite? What is this place that we return to? I'm thinking of love. Yes, love again. But where does it begin and what does it return to? Does love begin from a place of lovelessness or does it start from love? Do we begin from love? Emotions move like water and air and rain and grain from a higher gradient to a lower one. We want our love to fill the person who has all our affection. We use the metaphor of the container over and over again. I am filled with love. It brims over, Mirabai sings. Does love return to us like the singer's voice returns to the summer? Summer, I learned much later, meant same. What did it imply? Returning to the same place? What is the same place if not the earth? Is the singer and the song the same after it had made its journey towards the next stanza? Can I remain the same person after I have loved or been loved? We have all intuitively known love as a place of return, like the summer one returns to for both beginning and end. The summer is like the heart, the oldest house we know. It can accommodate our infinite returns. The earth is like that. It can accept our infinite footsteps, those that carry us away through stairs and ladders and then into air, and those that bring us back to it. Our footsteps still wet, leaking from our recent life in water. We go to air and water and space for holidays. 
but we have to return to earth to make love. Neither air nor water will be able to hold the comedy of our bodies. It is perhaps the earth we see in each other when making love. Where else do all the metaphors of digging and farming and sowing and pottery come from? The same Ananda, the intuitive awareness of belonging to this world of the elements marks our nomenclature. When a cousin was born to my brother and me, we were so fascinated by her that we began calling her Mitti, a corruption of the Bangla word Mishti, meaning sweet, that adults were using for her. Hindi was not ubiquitous in our small town lives then as it is now. So it did not strike us that we were giving a nickname, a dark name, literally the name by which one is called dark to her. How might it feel to be the bearer of such a name? Mitti, both its sound and meaning, has the intimacy of texture. We see and feel its graininess. There are others everywhere around us, a history that we are being drugged to forget. Take two, Bhuvaneshwar and Bhuvandanga, for instance. Bhuvan plus Ishwar is Bhuvaneshwar. Bhuvan or Bhuvan is earth or palace, the world and the home. Ishwar is, of course, God, as you know. There's Bhuvaneshwari, another name for the goddess Durga, the gods and goddesses of the earth. How liberating to have gods one can walk with instead of having to look up at the sky to find them on temporary leave. Bhubondanga is the name of the neighborhood in Shantaniketan where my mother grew up. Bhubondanga seems a bit pathological. Danga is field, often inside a forest, but it also means land. And so Bhubon, meaning the earth, having a suffix that stands for land or a pathway, seems like a reiteration of an impulse. That impulse, through the stress on the earth and its land, seems to be about the wonder that is the earth itself. Then there are the names of neighborhoods, such as the ones in my hometown. Amtala and Pakurtala and Bortala. Tala being a suffix meaning under. Going back to a time when people sat under these trees, the mango and the fig and the banyan. Or Champashari, close to where I live, an avenue of Champa trees. There is both delight and direction in this naming. Now all of these are gone. The trees, the delight and wonder, only the names like empty carton, making us forgetful of what was once carried in them. The same Ananda is manifest in the way we think of the poem. The way we walk on the earth with our feet in meter. We want our poets, poems to do the same. The various meters, including the Mandakranta meter, invented by the Sanskrit poet Kalidasa more than 1500 years ago for his cloud messenger poem, are only an expression of our relationship with the earth. The way we walk, run, crawl, tiptoe, crouch, and move on it. The same instinct for the discovery of one's relationship with the earth explains the many forms on the potter's wheel or Sita, Ram's wife, being born in an agricultural field. Oh. There's also Bhut Chakrabashi, not far, not very far away from this day, with its rituals of brooms and sweeping the earth. I'm not really thinking or interested in the ancient imagination that saw the earth as the goddess Lakshmi, the bearer of bounty and wealth. But this seems obvious and evident, as I am in the, in, as I am in the consequences of such a belief in Bhut Chakrabashi. This worship through proxy of something that means the earth, of what accumulates on his skin, even as one knows that it will gather at some other part of the body, it's always a surprise when one pays attention to it. So the use of the broom. Shringar then becomes related to the idea of con conservation, of doing with what one has, or making do with what one has, knowing that addition and subtraction are only about a change of place and beauty and love and affection derives from just this wisdom of adequacy and sufficiency of what is at hand rather than the necessity of adding or requiring or needing something extraneous. With that acknowledgement, it seems natural that clay, script of the earth's body, should be used to create earthen pots to hold fire. That whitish clay or 
a rice paste used to paint its body, or that even ash, the result of something burned, men, animals, or their habitat, could be used to nourish the soil, or even if it was part of a ritual, to mark bodies and spaces as sacred. Perhaps that is what the jharu or broom and its relationship with the goddess of wealth signified, that wealth and abundance was below our feet, not something that needed to be created, just as Shringar, both beauty and affection, was here. The broom and the footprint of the goddess Lakshmi, a reminder that for centuries now, we have been drawing the goddess's feet on the land on which we are walking, that we are co-sharers of this courtyard, that is this planet. They always led inward, the goddess to stay in the house. And beside them one drew from cultural memory, rice stalks in a stylized manner that the tradition of Alpona had polished over time. This Shringar of the earth through the earth with its many variations or versions on the human body and their habitats reminds us that our notion of the sacred as it stands today, or as it once stood, derives from the distance that has grown between us and living with the earth, with its constituents. But now, so long I've only tried to chronicle an intimate and speculative history of Ananda in relation to the natural world. Where is it now? Where is Ananda now? Why do we experience an inexplicable sense of sadness all the time? Grief we have been conditioned to understand as a consequence of events and incidents in our personal history that affect our mental weather. We've been told, and correctly so, of course, that everything else and this too shall pass, that it will change as the weather changes every day. But this grief that we are experiencing doesn't seem to go away at all. I realize that it is not just me. Almost all of us are feeling what is now being called climate fatigue, this exhaustion that just won't leave. What is causing this? I think it's Viraha, separation from the earth we are biologically conditioned to expect. This separation, confusing as it is, and mostly painful, as songs sung over generations about human love remind us, is because of the force field of the loved one to which one must return. We are now confused by an unfamiliar earth. <coughs> we often speak of the effect of landscape on us. We see the effect of our head on the pillow, but not the effect of the pillow on our head, on us. Similarly, we see the effect mostly disastrous humans have had on the environment. But what the environment, the effect the environment has on us is invisible. It is this that we are calling climate fatigue, climate grief, this exhaustion. Because I'm coming to this through the Rasa theory, I try to understand this viraha, this separation, primarily through two Rasas, at least for this lecture. The ananda that we get from separation from the beloved comes from Shingaras, the art emotion of love and beauty. It's what uh, Wordsworth would call a pleasurable pain. Separation from a familiar earth causes not Shingar, but Karuna Rasa, sadness and pain. It is because the viraha of Shingaras is propelled by hope, by hopefulness, the hope and the possibility that one will meet the loved one soon, whatever length the duration of the soon might be. The viraha of karuna rasa, of the kind that we experience in relation to the earth now, because of climate change, because of its permanence, is of pain, pain coming from the awareness that this is a permanent separation, not different or not this dissimilar to death. What is this language of climate grief? Please notice how grief is so phenomenally connect, uh, close to greed, grief, greed, as if there's a moral there. It is everywhere, this language of climate grief. The images, the dumping ground near Delhi, plastic, tarpaulin, graveyards of electronic waste, once precious, of things once precious, desired and loved, now so easily abandoned and discarded. Neon, the CFL and LED lights, 
colors from these sources that do not belong to nature, electronic, the digital, a rotting of the visual. The language of light, what was once called enlightenment is everywhere privileged, overwhelming us. We seek because we need the dialect of shade. A life outside our this narrow understanding of reason that has produced concepts like progress and development. What do they cause us? What are they causing us? Grief? How does it love? How does this grief suddenly lapse into indifference? Is it like I love you said over and over again to a lover? We realize and we acknowledge that we are all living through a language of jadedness. I think it was Walter Pater who said that all art aspires to the condition of music. I'm sorry, Pater, I'll disagree. I think all art aspires to be nature. The Horatian art uh, urge, uh, the Horatian urge of art lies in concealing art is I think actually the urge of the human to hide as nature. And yet this art that pretends to be nature, whether it is painting or sculpture or, photogra or photograph or the motion picture, that cannot give us what we seek or what we need from nature or from life. Why do fallen branches and dried leaves not cause us the same feelings as say man-made debris? Why this difference? Is it only about optics? I can smell the very poor AQI in my nose and my nostrils as this mo at this moment as I speak to you. My understanding of Keech is when the human is too much of a wannabe the human trying too hard to be like nature, nature itself. We seek a space where we do not find the presence of the all of us, I think, without realizing it, or seeking a space where we do not find the presence of the human, anything that will convince us even momentarily that this, this place, this space is away from, is beyond the reach of the human, that this, what we see in front of us was not created by the human, the reason we seek forests and not parks. We seek this because we are seeking a space outside human control, outside power. What is causing us this permanent exhaustion, climate fatigue, is therefore the, this, of being on a leash, of being controlled by the human, like we regulate temperatures on air conditioners. I'll share an aside with you if you allow me. When Michelle Obama was asked about the first thing, this is on, from the Ellen show, on the Ellen show. So when Michelle Obama was asked about the first thing she'd like to do after leaving the White House, she said, I want to roll down the car windows that I couldn't in the last eight years for security reasons, of course. I want to feel the wind on my face. These are her words. I think that's a good metaphor for what we need to counter with climate fatigue the stepping back of human corporation. Now, even the individual human, you and I, all of us, is a corporation. What we need is for the elements to find their way back into us. They will, only if we do not dominate. A life, our life, our lives, an office, until we seek a break from it. We seek freedom, we seek a life to be cured of this cubicle-like life. Hence our quest for space. This urge is what makes us and keeps us human. Rabindranath Tagore writing to his writing to his niece in 1894, 1894 mind you, says how I love the light and the air. Perhaps because of my name as you know Robin in Rabindranath stands for the sun. So how I love the light and the air, perhaps because of my name, Goethe had said before he died, more light, if I had to express a wish at a time like that, I would say more light and more space. I'm not yet satiated with what I have drunk of the sky." Unquote. This is from Chinnabodro. Our vocabulary, I was telling Rahul in this informal conversation just because I just before this you know kind of talk began that our vocabulary has to change. Um, even an awkward figure of speech, say such as pathetic fallacy, that we discourage our students from using in their poems, uh, even something as awkward as pathetic fallacy used by our linguistic ancestors 
got the instinct, instinctive connection between the human and the natural world right. It worked better than our apocalyptic language, which is meant to show urgency, but soon lapses into indifference. We, I, all of us can do all the verbal acrobatics and pyrotechnics, but all this cleverness in language does not address or communicate the constant climate uh, fatigue we feel. We desperately need a language of intimacy, of familiarity, an escape from the language of the apocalyptic and the bureaucracy that is being used to speak about nature and the environment. We have to speak of the natural world as we do about humans, about each other. We need to find the vocabulary to gossip about the natural world, for instance. The disconnect with the natural world is not new though is marked in our language. Bangla, for instance, is said to have originated from Magadhi Prakrit, Pali, and Sanskrit. There's a binary here that is not often acknowledged, that Sanskrit was the language of Sanskriti, culture, and Prakrit, the language of Prakriti, nature. This awareness that is never really allowed to rise to the surface throbs like a blood vessel when I begin reading some of the Bengali poets from the early 20th century. Like Baudelaire, who was trying to create a vocabulary of the city in Plaza of Evil, these poets seem to be groping for a language that will allow nature, plant and animal life, the elements, rivers, and the sky to speak and be spoken about in a language different from the language of the human. Wordsworth, one of the first decidedly nature poets in the English language, was also one of the first moderns in English literary history who made a case for the language of poetry to be brought close to the linguistic instinct of who he called the common man. These poets in Bengal, a little more than a hundred years after, came after Wordsworth, I mean. Having unconsciously or consciously benefited from the uh, impulse, from that impulse of the manifesto, both in the preface to lyrical ballads and the transition from Shadhu to Cholid Bhasha, as poetic, or Choli Bangla as poetic language, became interested in exploring and creating a language beyond the Wordsworth and language of the common man. It was as if language must be returned to Prakriti, to nature, for the natural world to be accessible to us. This ambition, honest as it undoubtedly is, is marked by the awareness, though it might be unconscious to these writers, at least at that point of time, they were seeking in language what has been lost or is being lost every moment. They are turning to language to hold in it what the world can't anymore. What I mean to emphasize is this sense of belatedness, this constant of modern life and modern living, of the natural world having been a more ideal home than the state it is in today. The nagging awareness of a connection between the human and nature that has been lost. Rabindranath Tagore, because he feels it, notices it in Kalidasa writing 1500 years before him, during whose time we expect the human to have been more in tune with the natural world. I quote a few sentences from Rabindranath's essay on Megdutam. This is what he writes, and this is in Shopan Chakraborty's translation. From Ramagiri to the Himalayas ran a long stretch of ancient India over which life used to flow to the slow, measured Mandakranta meter of the Megdutam. We are banished from that India, not just during the rains, but for all time. Gone is Dashanna with its growth, hedged with Ketaki plants, where before the onset of the rain, the birds among the roadside trees fed on household scraps and busily built their nests. While in the jam corpse on the outskirts of the village, the fruit ripened to a color, dark as the clouds. And then, how charming are the names of the rivers, mountains, and cities of that segment of ancient India. Avanti, Vidisha, Ujjaini, Vindhya, Kailash, Devagiri, the Reva, the Shipra, the Vitravati. There is a comeliness, a dignity, a purity about those names. It seems as if since those days, the times have become more and more vulgar. Our language, manners, and outlook have withered and declined. Our naming of 
things these days follows the pattern we feel that if we could only find a way back to avanti or vidisha on the bank of the river the shipra or the nirvindya we would be freed of the vulgar cacophony that surround us today unquote the longing for a connection with plant life with a sense of relatedness marks the poetry of the bengali poets jivanananda dash shakti chattopadhyay and binoy mojumdar the scientist jagadish chandra bose search for a korulipi a plant script that he imagined would be created by plants themselves this longing for a connection with plant life is also to be found in shukumar ray's nonsense rhyme and language of plant and animal life outside existing language or obonindranath tagore's cartoon kutum his found art of tree branches that he rearranged to look like animals it's a quest in all of them as it is inside us to discover or create a language of recovery that will enable or reestablish that connection however imagined it might be the protection of all the species that have managed to survive both natural and human made cal- calamities seems to be the goal of all our environmentalists it is certainly a noble and necessary aim but why do we need any species besides the human to survive our scientists will tell us in detail what the religious philosophers of the renaissance had been forcing us forcing on the conditioning of humans the great chain of being and so on the moderns trying to secularize that awareness of being connected named it after another species as it were the butterfly effect it is a parable of dependence a repetition of no man being an island in a different intellectual dialect if bees become extinct so will humans we are the head that becomes the stay to every action and argument it's not just species sh- species sorry it's not just species chauvinism at work it's the inability of the human to think beyond causality the scientific arguments about species extinction are of course necessary and they are urgent but we've been at it for a few decades now for almost half a century and more haven't we and yet very little has been achieved for for too little has been sacrificed and too much and too many blamed the puritanical language of blaming and shaming and abstention hasn't achieved very much has it restrictions whether legal or those that stem from the conscience are a challenge to our freedom however illusory that freedom might be might be again i quote line from rabindranath who is himself is going back to the upanishads raso vaisa rasam heva my I, i don't have sanskrit so please bear with me as i try to pronounce this word labdhan dhanandi bhavati i'll translate he indeed is rasa this rasa it is that makes human kind feel joy we will not want to destroy what gives us ananda in the way we do not normally kill our own children not only because they are ours by blood but because of the joy they bring to us continually in installments always i'm li- leaning on this essentialist line of argument of course but i want to emphasize through this that a bureaucratic imagination with its anemic codes and dialects relies on an apocalyptic narrative i hear the phrase threaten species from time to time i smile it is possible that i smirk at us at myself how language allows us to hide particularly our faults threatened threatened species threatened by whom by us running through in another game quote It is a sign of the recurrence of the ascetic ideal of the puritanic age when enjoyment as an end in itself was held to be sinful when enjoyment loses its direct touch with life growing fastidious and fantastic in its world of elaborate conventions then comes the call for renunciation which rejects happiness itself as a snare i can assert the general truth that when a man tries to thwart himself in his desire for delight 
converting it merely into his desire to know or to do good, then the cause must be that his power of feeling delight has lost its natural bloom and health. This is from Religion, and Art, Religion of an Artist by Rabindranath. This delight, unquote, this delight was once accessible to all, irrespective of their identity. Bhivuti Bhushan Bandapadhyay remarks on this difference between the natural and the social world in his novel Pothir Pachali. Durga, the young girl, girl in the novel, has just been beaten in the scene that I'm going to read for you or share with you, has just been beaten for stealing a few mangoes. And then these words come. Remember, she's just been beaten for stealing a few mangoes. And then these words. This is in Rimi's translation. Even in the faint light of the evening, the rest of the field gleamed. Yellow laburnums were scattered all over the field and every tree was in full blossom. Circles of wild wood rose sprouted everywhere, creating little havens of cool darkness within them. Jewel blue bluebells bloomed on vines wrapped around trees, peeking out from under the thick foliage to glitter in the sun. Spiky amaranth, blue pea, and numerous other wildflowers grew in thick bushes all over the world are putting the field in bright colors, unquote. The sentence that follows this is a political critique, not necessarily in just the tradition of what man has made of man, but of an alternative history, a possible history that what, of what might have been had humans been like plants. I read again in Rimi's translation from Pothir Pachali. Remember, we've just encountered two ships Durga being beaten for stealing mangoes, then the one wonder that uh, we are shown uh, in that particular landscape, and then this. And it's seamless. Everything glittered and glowed. I want you to notice this line, this sentence, sorry. There was no sign of poverty or of middle class, class miserliness anywhere. There was no sign of poverty or of middle class miserliness anywhere. Nature had upturned her bowl of plenty upon the land like an empress bestowing largess. And the little boy, that's Opu, Durga's uh, brother, and the little boy could not tear his eyes away. His world so far had been rather a narrow one, limited to his home, his friend Nara's house, their neighbor Anudidi's place and those parts of the neighborhood that were close to this their remote little house. This evening, with its woods, rabbits, indigo ruins, and the misty, boundless field of bright colors was a revelation to him. In his heart, he was certain that he had stumbled upon the gateway to a magical land." Unquote. Please note what Bhivuti Bhushan is trying to tell us. Now, only the wealthy have access to this Ananda, to this Ananda. Their weekend retreats, their farmhouses, their various genres to demand nature writing as nutritious and expensive as their organic and vegan lives. What I have shared with you is of course not new to you. They are not negative thoughts either. I say this because we're living through a time when only negative news, negative thoughts, negative wishes get PRP. I wanted to share the opposite, a reminder, a remembrance, and through this a hope and possibility, even if only for a very short period of time, for these few minutes, that there might still be a way for Ananda to re-enter our lives. But even before climate change turns us into refugees of some kind or the other, Climate grief will kill us, is killing us. We complain about unequal relationships, about how our lives would have been happier had those we loved loved us back equally. The only equal relationship we perhaps have was with the Earth, this planet. Let the more loving one be me. Yes, Huxley. No. We haven't been the more loving one. We have been disloyal 
and damaging and toxic to borrow words that we use for our human relationships. That is why instead of Ananda, we have been left, what we have been left with is grief, climate grief, a climate of grief, Nirananda. Thank you.